Welcome to this episode of Monday Morning Joe. I'm Joyce O'Shaughnessy. Monday Morning Joe is a quick hitting coffee talk style four episode series that will cover what you need to know about antibody drug conjugates or ADCs for treatment of the historically difficult to treat triple negative breast cancer, as well as metastatic HR positive HER2 negative breast cancer that has become resistant to endocrine therapies. Please remember to subscribe to the Exchange CME YouTube channel and make sure notifications are turned on so you can be prompted when new episodes are released. Today, we're going to discuss the potential treatment emergent adverse events that can occur with treatment with the ADCs and importantly, how to manage them in our practice. Although the ADCs are designed as targeted therapies to deliver their cytotoxic payloads directly to the tumor cells and theoretically avoid off-target uh, toxicity on normal cells, there are, of course, some adverse events, some toxicities, as well as some serious adverse events that we need to be aware of. So it turns out that the specific cytotoxic payload, as well as the specific monoclonal antibody matter in terms of what the toxicities are for TDM1, TDXD, and sasituzumab gobatecan, and they're different. So it's really not a class effect of cytotoxicities. Now, the overall incidence of ADC-associated adverse events occur, but there is thankfully a low incidence of grade three or higher adverse events. Now, there is a black box warning for TDXD with regard to ILD, interstitial lung disease, which is pneumonitis. It turns out that with TDXD, there is a higher chance of getting ILD with higher doses of TDXD. So it is dose uh, dependent. Most of it when it occurs is grade one or two, but unfortunately it can be grade three and it can also be fatal. Patient comorbidities such as older age, extensive prior treatment, history, lung disease, heart failure, other significant comorbidities really need to be considered as we think about offering patients TDXD because these comorbidities can increase the risk for a serious adverse event, including ILD. Another black box warning we want to be aware of is with sasituzumab govotecan, and it's for grade three or higher neutropenia in combination with diarrhea. So in the ASCENT trial, which was the phase three triple negative breast cancer trial, the incidence of grade three or higher neutropenia was 51% with sasituzumab and was 33% with chemotherapy. The incidence of grade three diarrhea in the ASCENT trial was 10% with SG and less than 1% with chemotherapy. These rates were similar in Tropics O2. And of course, that is what we want to try to avoid is substantial neutropenia, especially grade four neutropenia in the context of substantial diarrhea. So how do we prevent and manage ILD? So we got to have a very careful patient history. Any history of antecedent ILD is a strict contraindication to using uh, TDXD. Um, we want to get a baseline and then about every eight to nine to 12 weeks, we want to repeat a non-contrast high resolution CT scan to facilitate early diagnosis, asymptomatic ILD with a little ground glass or a little bit of infiltrate before the patients have any symptoms. We really have to educate patients to call us right away if they have any symptoms of ILD, such as shortness of breath, cough, or unexplained uh, fever. If the patients have any ILD symptomatic, any concern for it, we get a CT scan. If we are getting a CT scan, we see grade one asymptomatic changes of ILD on the CT scan. We immediately interrupt the uh, TDXD. For symptomatic TDXD, we get the pulmonologist involved, we get the steroids uh, going, and it may be a bronchoscopy to rule out other um, uh, superimposed uh, problems. And this is now for grade one, if it's asymptomatic, many of us will choose to treat that patient um, ourselves with a course of uh, steroids. So grade two or higher, Steroids are absolutely indicated and need to get started as soon as possible. For grade one, I think most of us will treat with steroids because we want to 
uh, have it clear. We want it to resolve so we can then reinstitute the TDXD. And I think it's prudent to do it at a one dose level uh, reduction. If patients have symptomatic ILD, it's a hard stop. We uh, need to treat it and get it resolved, but we do not re, uh, re-challenge with the uh, TDXD. There was a recent pooled analysis of patients with HER2 altered cancers, uh, all kinds of cancers, who developed grade one ILD or pneumonitis following treatment with TDXD and showed that once it resolved on the CT scan and these patients were rechallenged with TDXD, that rechallenge was indeed safe and possible for the majority of patients following resolution, but there were some patients who did have recurrent ILD. Fortunately, it again was uh, treatable, and I think it's prudent myself if we're going to rechallenge to do a one-dose level reduction because we do know that the ILD is dose-dependent. Sasituzumab govotecan um, can be associated with severe neutropenia. And so the sasituzumab is given on day one and eight of a 21-day cycle, and if you're concerned that your patient really is at risk for grade four neutropenia, we can give GCSF after day eight, particularly if they're coming in on day eight and they have a borderline neutrophil count. We can also give it prophylactically if your patient has a history of substantial neutropenia. We can give GCSF prophylactically after day eight. This actually may prevent the need for dose interruption or dose reduction. And patients who are frankly neutropenic at day eight can be given GCSF for three to five days after day one of the SG. What about cardiac toxicity related to TDXE? Well, fortunately, it's quite uncommon. There was a a 7.7% risk of a prolonged QT interval and a 1.9% risk of a decreased left ventricular ejection fraction with uh, TDXD, but most of the patients were asymptomatic. We do want to evaluate the LVEF prior to the initiation of trastuzumab ADCs and at regular intervals during treatment with trastuzumab ADCs, or of course, as clinically indicated. If patients have any um, signs or symptoms of uh, decreased LVEF, congestive heart failure, we of course want to interrupt the um, TDXD um, and get a cardiology consultation, or if a patient's LVEF falls substantially and to less than 50%. We want, of course, interrupt and get a cardiology consultation. Other treatment emergent adverse events that may affect patients' quality of life include GI toxicity, such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So prophylactic olanzapine, um, either by itself or in combination with other IV antiemetics, is highly effective at treating antibody drug conjugate-related nausea and preventing vomiting. Loperamide's very useful, of course, with diarrhea, as is a bland diet. And of course, we want to watch for electrolyte disturbances in patients who have substantial diarrhea. We want to let patients know that there is a possibility of alopecia. Uh, Generally, patients will get alopecia as well as some fatigue. So the take-home points with regard to toxicity are that the different antibody drug conjugates are associated with a different profile of toxicities. And of course, these need to be managed um, proactively so patients can benefit from these agents. So based on the published data, ADCs do result in a high incidence of adverse events, but fortunately, a low incidence of serious adverse events, grade three, four, uh, grade three or four. So please join me next week when I discuss the most recent data presented at ESMO 2024 regarding the ADCs and treatment of metastatic breast cancer. Clinicians, nurses, and pharmacists can also visit exchangecme.com for free access to CME in a variety of therapeutic areas. Thanks again. We'll see you on the next episode of Monday Morning Joe.